Welcome to this edition of The Soul of Warren County. I'm Mickey Gwynn, and today we have the second part of our interview with Lester Strode. Lester, welcome back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Appreciate all the stories, and now we're going to go from amateur Lester to pro Lester. Uh, you all mentioned right. your coach was telling you scouts were coming down and looking at you. Did you have a point where you said, yeah, I think I'm going to get drafted? Or you just say, hey, we'll see what happens? Well, yes, I did. I did get to that point. I mean, throughout the whole course of the year, they're following you. They're pulling you aside, talking to you about, trying to see what your, your interest really is because this is an investment for them. Right. And, and I had no idea what the process of professional baseball, how the scouting, how the draft, any of that. I had no idea of any of that. So to me, it was like, okay, just another part of life, I guess, I'm going to have to deal with, you know. Uh, but, uh, yes, I, I started getting that feel that I'm going to end up in professional baseball. Where, who, and when, that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So how did you find out? Where, where, did you get a phone call? How did, how, did, how did that work? I was actually at home practicing with the Rocky. <laughs> and um, I had got back from a practice, and I got a phone call. And it was from Major League Baseball saying, telling me, it was like a couple of days before the draft, saying, Lester, we'd like for you to be around the phone on, I'm just going to throw a date out there, on the 22nd of June, and uh, that's the first day of the draft, and we'd like for you to be at home at that time uh, because it's, it's a possibility you could be drafted that day, and if you are, you will receive a phone call from the team that drafts you. And the first day, if I'm not mistaken, it was usually the first three rounds. Mm -hmm. So when he told me that, I'm like, wow, I'm going to be in that top tier, you know what I mean? So um, that's how I found out that this possibly could re be real and I could get a call because I had to be home. Mm, okay. So you got that call from uh, a member of the, the Royals management, the coach? What, what was that call like? Um, I, I actually stayed home that first day, right, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, I told my mom, "I'm out of here. Yeah, you know, hey, I'm not gonna keep sitting here." And I, because I, I, I wasn't in that first three rounds, right, right. So, so I left, went home. I mean, went. I don't know. Went out, hung out with the guys. So the next day, I started the process again, and I'm waiting, and I'm like, "I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing this again." But I was leaving, and the phone rang. And it was actually from our, uh, my, the scout that scouted me, Gary Blaylock. Okay. He called me and told me, Lester, you had just been selected fourth round with the Kansas City Royals. And that's when I found out. So, so what's going through, through your mind? Are you like, I didn't want to be a Royal. I want to be a Brave. I mean, are you like, yeah, okay, <laughs> let's do this. Nikki, as I said earlier in, the, in our interview, <laughs> I had no idea of any of this <laughs> stuff. Really, I, 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 man, I, 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 I didn't even know there was a Kansas City Royals baseball team. To be very frank with you, you know, I was just playing baseball. Right. right. And the only team I knew of was the Atlanta Braves because I got to see them on TBS, and, you know, or the Saturday uh, uh, evening, uh, Saturday morning baseball. Every Saturday it was a baseball right. game on. So, but anyway, when. Uh, <laughs> It's so funny when you think about it. Anyway, he called me and said, look, yes, we're gonna, we, we, uh, we drafted you fourth round, Kansas City Royals, and um, I'm going to be there in a couple of days, and we'll talk about uh, your contract and so forth. I had no idea there was money involved in this. <laughs> I really, I did a contract. Right. You know, they can pay me to play some baseball now. You know, so uh, anyway, I, uh, I called Leo Davis because – Leo has a history of, I don't know if you know it or not, but he has a history of playing professional baseball. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He played yeah. with Billy Williams, by the way. Right. Hall yep. of Famer. So um, I called him, and I, I just told him what happened and so forth, and I said, I have no idea, you know, uh, w where it goes from here. You know, he says, well, have you have somebody to represent? I said, what do you mean represent me? Yeah, they're going to come there, and they're going to talk to you about a contract and so forth, and you guys are going to negotiate, and I had no idea about m what type of money I was worth or whatever, you know. Right. So I said, well, can you, you, you've been there for me on everything else. Can you be there for me for this one too, you know? And um, I had him and my dad, when Gary came in town, he stayed at the 
hotel out here on Sparta, uh, Sparta Highway. Is that Best Western, I believe it is? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so he's out there, and I, he said, hey, tomorrow can we meet at 10 o'clock? And I said, okay, I'll be there. My dad, he must have took off from work, by the way, for this one. <laughs> 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 but he, myself, and Leo, we met there, and the, the guy, we went in, the, in his room, and he says, okay, uh, here's, here's what we got for you. You know, and we started negotiating, and and again, I had no idea what kind of money they're going to be throwing out and so forth. And I, you know, and, and this first time of everything for right, me. And right. He threw out some stuff and, and I'm like, well, you know what? I, I ain't taking whatever he say first. You right, know? Right, right. So um, Leo was speaking for him. He said, no, sir, he's, he's, he's beyond that, you know. And, and it's funny because the guy said, he says like, well, I knew he wasn't going to take that, you know. <laughs> But that's what they told me to offer, offer him. him. <laughs> yeah, you know, like that. He said, now let's get down to business, you know, like that, you know. And I'm just sitting there like, okay. And then when they start talking thousands, I'm like, hmm? Huh? And then uh but we the first day we didn't we didn't finish it out, you know. Oh, really? No. Oh okay. no, 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 no. And he and, and and me being a senior in college, he says, he, he, I, I never forget what he says, Celeste, you don't have no whole lot of negotiating room. He said, because where are you going at that? Honestly, what he didn't know is I really didn't care. Yeah, you know he didn't know that. But right, I really right, didn't right. care because I that was something that wasn't on my plate. Right, you know. Right. But uh, the next morning I went home and my dad he drove me and we went back home. On the way there, he goes like I, I asked him. I said, Dad, I said, what do you think? You know, he says, Hey, it's your decision. You know, because I mean, yeah, I mean, at that point in time, the little bit he offered me was a lot of money at that time. Oh, sure. You yeah. know. And I go, what do you think? He says, I'm not making that decision for you. You're you going to have to make this decision on your own. So, of course, all night I couldn't sleep. Right, right. So I'm waking up and I'm going like, okay, they had a, they had a, 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 a blank amount of bonus money. Then they had an incentive package that was worth some money. Right. So I told my dad next time, I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the bonus and tell them, put that incentive in right up front. And if they do that, I'm going to sign. He said, if that's what you want to do, do it. I went in, uh, I went over by myself the oh, next okay. morning. Went over by myself, knocked on Gary's door. There wasn't no, there wasn't no phones back then. Well, it was phones, but I didn't have the number. So I went and knocked on his door. Come in, I said, okay, here's the deal. I'll sign if you, if you give me this package. And, he, and I told him what it was. He said, well, I got to make a call to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Made the call to Kansas City, got off the phone, signed the papers. And here I go. At that point, I mean, you're still senior in college, single guy. Is it sort of dawning on you now that all of a sudden the game that you loved all these years now is going to have to pay the bill? Did, did that set in already? Or were you still on that high? I, I, I'm still on the high because I'm still trying to come to sense with all this yeah. stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, what in the world is going on? You know, you, 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 you get ready to go play professional baseball and – you have no idea what, what you're getting yourself into. Right. And the thrill of you being one of the top players in the country that someone has drafted you to be in their organization, mm -hmm. think you have a career of helping them out win in a World Series or something in the future. You know, it was just, I was, I probably in blinders at that time. Yeah. yeah. And then I got to leave home and so forth and all that, you know, and. So I was, I was still feeling around. I was still feeling around. So what was your first uh, location when you, when you went to camp? That was a part of my negotiation again. Oh, okay. Because I did some homework. And I was trying to talk them into sending me to A ball as opposed to going to rookie ball. Because mm -hmm. I thought I was better than rookie <laughs> ball. <you know? laughs> hey, I just competed against some college teams. I just dominated. Yeah. I done led NIA two yeah. years in a row. I'm an All-American. <laughs> you know, I ain't no rookie here. You know? <laughs> but, you know, when I, but what still hadn't been realistic, hadn't set in on me is like, I'm not just going against people here in the United States who are some of the best of the best. Mm. I'm going against the world now, yeah. and I had yeah. realized that, you know, and all these Caribbean uh, islands, uh, Venezuela, uh, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, big time baseball, baseball countries, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, that I'm competing against. So I, I'm, I'm trying to talk him to him. Look, no, I, I, I want to go to A ball. No, no, Leslie, hey, you're going to rookie ball now. 
based upon how well you do, right. that will dictate how long you'll be in a ball. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to rookie ball. You know, so that's why I started in, in the Gulf Coast League in, in um, Sarasota, Florida. Rookie oh, okay. Ball. Okay. And were most of the players about on the same level, or did you have still have some different degrees of, of sort of ability at rookie level? Were oh, yes. Much, yeah. Oh, different degrees of different, ability. Even at rookie level. You, you know, me being a senior uh, out of college first year, and then we, you got high school seniors oh, that's okay. mixed in okay. here, too. Okay. So there's different degrees of uh, level of baseball and areas mm -hmm. makes a big difference. You know, California baseball is a lot different than uh, the, 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 the Midwest baseball, you know, mm -hmm. the, the talent is usually a little bit better out of the, out of the West and, and South, the South, Texas, Florida, you know, talent is usually a bit better because they play more baseball and, and it, it, it's more um, competitive, you might say. Yeah, because some of those places probably pay base, could probably play baseball almost year round. Right. You know, right. the warm California, climates down in Arizona, yeah, California, Florida, those kind, those kind of places. So, so you... So you arrive in, in rookie ball, and hi, I'm Lester Stroh from McMinnville, Tennessee, right? Right, <laughs> so you, hey, big, you know, big let, Mac. Let me show you what I can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. now, was, was rookie ball, you had, you had, was it shoulder surgery? I had elbow surgery. Elbow surgery. Yes. Was that in rookie ball? That was in rookie ball. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, unfortunate. I was, I was having a good start in rookie ball. Right. Uh, I was, I had, there was two number, uh, matter of fact, Kansas City had two number one picks that year, and, uh, uh, one was out of uh, Louisiana and the other one was out of Texas. And uh, so I'm going up like they're number one, I'm number four. I'm thinking they're way up on above me. And, right. But, you know, after getting there competing, I'm like, I'm just as good as they, they are. are. Yeah. But again, because they're coming from that different area, they just see them as a higher caliber player than it would be somebody coming out of Kentucky State, you mm -hmm. know, and the competition they're playing against compared to competition I'm playing. But the, I had the talent. They, they, they just, they, 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 they're scouting me and, and evaluating the, me off of the talent they see, not the area that I'm in, but right. still it makes a difference. Right, right. right. So, so you say you had the elbow surgery? Elbow surgery Were you having, 19, were you having some, 19, some problems? Yeah, prior I, um, to getting drafted, or did it come up after you got drafted? It came up after I got after drafted. drafted. I okay. have no problem prior to, and uh, that's a story within a story, uh, real quick though. But I, I never iced in my life, a career, college, high school, whatever. Right. And it was mandatory at that time that you iced. Now I'm not saying that the ice did it, but because um, I already had the issue, I had bone spur, I had a bone spur and bone chips. So I already had that issue, but it didn't bother me, because I guess because um, it, it, it I either was floating and not causing a problem, or it just, I, I wasn't pitching enough. Because I went from, uh, understand this too, I went from throwing maybe once a week to throwing every day. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. what, that's what you learn from college, high school, to going to professional baseball. You're throwing every day. Mm -hmm. Now you're not you're not pitching, but you're throwing every day. Well, in, in college, someday I may not even pick up a ball. In high school, sometimes we, we only time we picked up a ball sometime when we played. You right, know what I'm saying? Right. So it was a different uh, different um, uh, uh, challenge and and stress on the arm, you might say. So over that type of uh, 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 challenge, uh, uh, I, those injuries, uh, that, that issue with my elbow. Came up, came up, and uh, so I ended up having surgery in 1981. Drafted in 80, surgery in 81. And how was the recovery from the surgery? Did it go well? Well, I can tell you it was, uh, the doctor was out of Nashville, um, and uh, when, I, <laughs> when I went in to see him, and he, he did the MRI and so forth, and he said, oh, man, he says, this is not good. You got a bone spur on the back of your elbow here, and you got bone chips here and I'm not sure how much uh, damage you've done, and even if even if you're going to be able to pitch after this oh, surgery. Oh wow! Yeah, that's he flat out told me Man. because he said every time I extended my elbow, it was cutting my ligament. Oh, okay. Yeah, that spur was. So I and I looked at him. I said, Doc, I'm not pitching now. So let's go do it. You know, <laughs> and that's what happened. And and uh, he did the surgery. And he told me, this was in January, he told me I wasn't going to pick up a ball until June, middle of June. Six full months. Yes. 
but I was determined to get back. <laughs> I, w I was pitching again in April. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Not to say it didn't hurt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going through the pain right. and the suffering of it. Right. But I was determined I was going to get back. And lo and behold, did I not know that I was actually doing myself injustice because I was sitting at home at that time uh, uh, rehabbing, but I was getting paid. Mm -hmm. Well, I could have stayed at home till the middle of June and, and got still got paid. paid. Yeah. But once they found out what I was doing, pack your bags, get on down here. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's probably what you wanted to do. Anyway, well, yeah. I mean, you, want, you got that competitive spirit, so yes. you, wanted, you wanted to do that. So you come back after, uh, after the surgery, mm -hmm. still at that point in rookie ball. Mm -hmm. Take us through, through those steps up the ladder, I guess you could say. Well, it, it, was, it was sort of a, a new start for me because I had lost uh, some of my physical ability to, you know, my, I'm, still, I'm still in the rehab mode. I wasn't throwing as hard. You know, I'm going through a few little complications, a flare up here, flare up there, you know, and, you know, it makes you start thinking like, well, really, is this going to happen? Am I going to be able to make this come back or not, you right. know, and, uh, and, 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 and I just kept working at it, working at it. And, and, and again, working with the trainers and the rehab people constantly instilling confidence in you and trying to keep your mindset right, you know, and just keep working. It's going to take time, you know, and plus I'm ahead of the game because again, April instead of probably having a lot of those complications, but I didn't wait to June, like he said, right. and I'm doing it in April. So anyway, to make a long story short, one day I woke up and it was gone. No more pain. Mm -hmm. It was gone. And then it was just a matter of now uh, getting back that velocity, getting back that uh, 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 competitiveness to go out and compete the, 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 the normal way that I, 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 no, that I was doing prior to the surgery. Right. And um, I think I pitched two or three rookie games and I was out on my way to A-ball. You know, and I went, they sent me to Charleston, South Carolina, and I finished the season there uh, before the end of the season. And then after that season, they brought me to Instructional League where it's a selected few go to, and they brought me there, and I competed there for mm -hmm. the, till no, almost December. Yeah. So, and all that was happening within the course of, of the same year almost. Right. right. That, that's why I consider my rehab year. Yeah. That's why I consider my rehab year. And, and I, I guess similar to going from high school to college, once you're in the program, the competition is pretty, pretty top level at that point, obviously. And, and, and you know you have to sort of step your game up to, to do those kind of things. Uh, next year, where, where were you at the year following that? Well, you got your spring training you go to, my okay. first spring training ever. First spring training. I had no okay. idea what that was about. I knew the facility because they did spring training at the facility where rookie ball was. Okay. Um, so, and it was in a dormitory situation. Everybody stayed in the dormitory. So when you go in there, you got your, um, you know, from AAA all the way down to rookie ball, all of us in this area here, um, they, they put you on a team, you know, and at that time coming out for my rehab year, they put me with the high A-ball team, which is in Fort Myers, and I'm competing to make the Fort Myers, absolutely, no, let me back up. I was competing, they put me, because I went to instructional league and had a good instructional league, they put me on the double-A roster to compete at the double-A level. And um, so I went, and I thought I had a good spring training. And some of the people that I competed with in, in the Structural League and, um, and in uh, Charleston, I thought I was just as good as they were. Mm -hmm. And they made it, and I didn't make it. And then that was a big disappointment because yeah. I wanted to go to double-A. Right. And then I had to go down to Fort Myers, and, and I pitched that year in Fort Myers. So, uh, but I enjoyed it, and it was a learning experience. That 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 really gave me the real insight of what competition and and how baseball worked mm -hmm. on the professional side. And and you said it was disappointing. Now, what happened the following years? Uh, I know you were you were down in the the minors for a few years after that. Yeah, so so the, to take you through the whole step, I started out in rookie ball, then I went to Charleston, South Carolina, and then from Charleston, South Carolina, again, I, I pitched in Fort Myers, uh, high A ball, and then the following year, I went uh, to double A in Jacksonville, and again, the next, an another demotion happened to me because the next year, I was competing for the triple A club, mm -hmm. 
didn't make it, so I had to go back to AA, and at that time, they moved to Memphis. Okay. So I was in Memphis pitching for a year, and I was only there for a half a year. I was doing so well that they moved me up to AAA uh, during the All-Star break because I made the All-Star. I didn't even get to stay in Memphis to, to be an all all the AA All-Star. <laughs> <laughs> they moved me up to AAA, and I finished the year up in AAA. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so the career is progressing pretty well. That yeah, it was, it's pretty much... Every year, yeah. I was I was making a promotion every yeah. year. That's yeah, good. that's yeah. good. That's good. Till I got to AAA. Tell us, <laughs> tell us about AAA. <laughs> AAA. Now you you that's you're competing against that some of that top notch. You know, to get to AAA is a challenge within itself. Right, right. And uh, you got guys in AAA that are you know guys that didn't make the big lit club that's coming down or. You know, guys that may be rehabbing again that's coming down. So it's it's a very competitive situation. And you if, if, if you ain't got your stuff together in AAA, you're going to know it real fast, mm -hmm. you know. But I, again, was able to compete there. But I never um, was able to consistently stay at that level to um, get myself to that next level. You know, I... I, I topped. I topped off. I topped off right, right there, you right. know. And partly, and a, a, some of it, um, and not no excuse or anything, but some of it was um, I started coming up with shoulder injuries, you know, stuff like that. You know, it just, I, it, it, I, I, I think I was, I reached my peak, you know, and I and I accepted that. And I really accepted when I got released. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> first time I got released. But anyway, I played AAA for four years. So I, I gave it everything I had over those four years. And uh, uh, finally, my time came to make another decision and I had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And that was the decision you made to start coaching? Yes. Did, yeah. did you did you know you that was something you wanted to do early before you had to make that decision? Another accident. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> another accident. I mean, I, I, I look at my career from, you know, even from as a kid all the way up to um, coaching. And it's like the good Lord gave me open the door and said, okay, that's what you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's your decision, what you're going to do with it. And I always seem like I always made the right decision. Right, right. You know, so I, like I told you, I just got released from the Baltimore Orioles from up in uh, Rochester, New York. Right. I'm driving home, going to St. Louis, Missouri. Mm-hmm. On the way home, I get a phone call. Uh, it's the farm director for the Chicago Cubs. Hey, Lester, um, we're interested in you. Are you still want to play or are you, you you hanging it up? Well, I got a wife, two kids, a house, Noah. <laughs> I need income. Right, right. Yeah, no, I still want to play. <laughs> I still want to play. <laughs> He says, okay, the team's in Louisville. You know, can you, how, how soon do you get to Louisville? I said, let me take my car home. I'll get on a plane the next morning, and I'll be in Louisville the next day. Mm -hmm. So I signed with the uh, uh, Chicago Cubs, uh, and that was in 1988. Um, and we they're in Louisville, so we played a game there. Went back to uh, Des Moines, Iowa, where the AAA club is. And the uh, pitching coordinator was Jim Coburn. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, he um, was out in the outfield. And I'm new to all of this whole scenario with the Cubs. And during batting practice, we, you know, sometimes we do what we call flat ground and a guy out there throwing pitches and just, you know, messing around and so forth. And Jim Coleman had a, a guy, I won't call his name out, out there. He was the number one pick for the Cubs, trying to teach him how to throw a sinker. Excuse me. So I turned around to this individual and I said, what, 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 are you do, what are you doing here? What are you trying to do? He's trying to teach him how to throw a sinker. I said, well, have you ever held it like this right here? He threw it, and like Jim Coburn jumps up. That's it. That's it. That's what I need you to do. How'd you hold that ball? Well, last time, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm in trouble. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so now I'm thinking the whole time I'm out there, I'm like, I got to go and apologize. I got to go and apologize. So I went in after practice, and I said, Jim, I just want to apologize. Don't you apologize. I've been trying to get him to do this for five years. <laughs> five years. Are you interested in coaching? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still playing. I'm thinking, like, I got, still got a chance. I'm left-handed, you right, know, right. and I'm having a good season with you guys. Maybe I can still do this thing, you know. And uh, so I'm thinking this over when he asked me that, and I'm like, no, not, I haven't had any thoughts about it. Not right now. I'm just focused on playing. Right. 
So then the farm director comes in at the end of the season, like, yeah, that's, I heard some good things about you, you know. He said, I heard you could be a good coach. Like that, he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not asking you to coach. I said, we like what you've done here. We'd like to sign you back. You're left-handed. You still have a shot. But I just want you to know, I have an opening right here. If you're interested in it, it's yours. So think about it. Whether you want, I want you back. I want to sign you back, AAA, or you can come over here and coach. You know, you let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give you a month or so to think about it. Next time I get a phone call. By then, I discussed it with my wife. You know, I done been through that release thing. Right, I'm, right. I don't want to go through that again. No. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is more steady. I got a job. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, got, <laughs> I got everything I'm going to need right here, you know. And I, we talked it over, and I made a decision going into coaching. Initially, what do you think was your biggest challenge as being a coach? Was it the sort of attitude of players or you having the confidence in yourself that they're going to listen to what you have to say? Well, what, what was your biggest challenge? I, I, I would say um, how I'm going to approach these guys to, to, to show them that I'm knowledgeable and I can help them uh, to try to help them succeed in, into whatever their goals are right. to get to the big leagues or whatever. Yeah, that, that was the challenge. It, having confidence in yourself to tell somebody else how to do something, you know, and, and, and whether it, it's about them trusting you and believing in you. Because you know? there's probably some players who just, you know, I've been doing it this way for years. Why do you want me to change, you know? Oh, yeah. But, but I, would, I would imagine it's probably a matter of, your attitude being, I think you can be better than that, you know, yes. and, and trying to get that over to people and things of that nature. So yes. I'm sure that can pose some, some challenges, but, but you stuck in there. And obviously, yes. obviously you were doing good things uh, because you've made a very long career out of it. So you were uh, pitching instructor, instructor in, the, in the, uh, the minors for how many years? Oh, I was a pitching instructor in the minor leagues for 20 20, no, I take it back, 18 years. Okay. And then was that when you got the call about coming to, to the Right. The, In 2007, I got the call about coming up to the big leagues, uh, being a part of Lou Pinella's uh, staff. And knowing Lou Pinella is going to be the manager, and you got this phone call to come up and be part of the staff, <laughs> what's going through your mind? I mean, and... and there's just you, the image of Lou Pinella from his days of being a, a manager and some of the tirades and the kick in the dirt. And all that. What, what are you thinking? <laughs> oh, I'm thinking, why Lou? <laughs> why Lou? Because like you say, you, you know, you, you've seen some of the history and you've heard some of the stories, right, you know. Right. And, and I'm like, man, I heard he's a tough cookie, you right. know, and like that, you know. But, um, you know, I, I, I went into it as like, you know, as long as I do my job, I should be okay, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and, and basically, that's, that's how it went. Um, he was a little different now. I mean, I, I, I can only judge at that particular time on what he did in my first couple of years as right. opposed to over time being with other managers. Right. But uh, tell you a quick story. Um, first game, playing the Atlanta Braves, open up the season with them. <laughs> We're beating them like two to one. Right. Started his job, the little middle guys and, and set up guys, done their job. Now the closer comes in. Uh, he blows the game. Okay, he blows the game, first game, lose upset. We go in, he's walking, he's pacing, he's talking about, you know, this and that, you know. We could have scored more runs. He, I mean, the man's knowledgeable. I mean, it's like he's playing this whole game in his head. Mm -hmm. Things that, that we should have done to, to not even make it a two-to-one game. Right. You know, um, and then why the pitcher, what happened? Less, did you tell him what he, you know, did you tell him what he's supposed to be doing? <laughs> Now, we, make, it, make it a long story short, we were there to 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, Nobody wow. wanted to leave as long as he was going through his tirade. <laughs> Nobody was going to get up. You know? right. And finally, Larry Rothschild, who was a pitcher, goes, said, Lou, I'm tired. I'm sleepy. I'm leaving. We, we, made, that, we made that statement. Everybody, else took Everybody But other than that, we just sitting there listening to him. Like, how long is this going to go yeah. on? You know? But, um, you know, Lou, Lou was funny, but he was very intense. He was very knowledgeable, and he was a good manager. But... Um, I, I really enjoyed it. And I guess you appreciate somebody who's got that kind of passion to win. And I, I think that's probably what, what his uh, bottom line was. He just wanted to win. Went, he just and wanted you know to win. What? Yeah. That's exactly what yeah, he, he just wanted he gave, to win. I got a taste of that one, too. Yeah, I can imagine. So <laughs> uh, the world championship year, 
going in spring training, coming out of spring training, starting the season, did the team have that feel or were you just like, well, you know, I think we're good, but I don't know. How did you feel that year? No, we felt very confident. Felt very confident. We felt very confident going into that season that we, we're the team to beat. We're the team to beat because that previous year where we wasn't supposed to have been even in the playoffs, we made it to the National League uh, Championship and got defeated. I forget who it was by. So coming back, not only we were coming back with the experience, younger guys got more experience. We added to the team. I think we added Lackey that year. Uh, we added Zobris to that year. Uh, we added um, oh, the right fielder, I, I lose, Jason Hayward. Oh, yeah. We've added some keynotes and even the, uh, a couple of relievers we added. Uh, so we felt like we're the team to beat, and, and we're projected as the team to beat. And uh, we came out of the gate and we started playing real well and just sailed on through the season. Yeah. And, and before then, the Cubs had, had all those years of futility and there's always the, the rumors about the, 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 the jinx of the yes. Cubs and all that, that kind of thing. So I know a lot, there was a lot of people just really pulling for you, too, outside of Chicago. A Absolutely. lot of people really pulling Absolutely. for you that year. And I think a lot of people was, was, were uh, happy to see that world, world championship. I, I, you know, I followed you all during your career and everything, and we'd be watching the Cubs games. And I'd point out to my family or friends, that's Lester. He's from my hometown kind of thing. <laughs> uh, I, I remember seeing you in the bullpen, and you had, your, you had your binder with you all the time. So were those stats on the, the, the batters and who maybe was going to be coming up? Was that, was that what you went over with the, the pitchers, or were you just trying to, trying to look, look the part? <laughs> See, Mickey, I meant to tell you what I used to tell the fans. <laughs> If I tell you what was in that book, I can't let you stay on this earth. <laughs> no, but on the serious side, though, yes, it was stats on, on, on the opposing team. It was also uh, what we call our um, uh, pitching um, strategy against the opposing hitter and so mm -hmm. forth. So it was a, some good information in that book. It wasn't just a binder there for me. I'm reading the magazine in there. No, <laughs> no, no, um, no. But any, you know, you'd be surprised how much info those relievers want to know going in some of those situations. Okay, does he swing your first pitch? Does he not swing your first? What he do on this? It, you, you, you name it, we could break it down. You know, you name it, we could break it down. So just them being knowledge, and I, and, I, and that's one of the key uh, statements I make now. Knowledge is power. You know, and that's what they was finding out. The more they knew when they walked across that white line, the more comfortable they were and confident they were that they can get this guy out. So, I mean, you, you came up, you know, sort of during a different era. So all the, all the data, all the numbers, you, you, you relished that. That, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a problem for you. No, no. Okay. But the, the, the difference in, in today and yesterday we didn't have that. I said, yeah, 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 our, yeah. Our, ours is whatever and you then, whatever, whatever you, you experienced remember, at right. that moment. Right. You remember that, yeah. So yeah, I did. I, I, if, if you know, and, and I look back over some of the things I've done as a teacher that I wish I had as a player. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I still would have made, it, but I would definitely had a better but advantage of, of, and, and opportunity to, right. to, to succeed. You know, yeah. And and I guess you know just to be able to look back and say I was part of a world championship team is something. You know, nobody can ever take away from you. No. Um, you know, as I tell people, ask me about what, what was that like? I, 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 tell me something about it. It's a life experience that only you're going to be able to understand is to be a part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, to set your goal to win the World Series and to achieve it is one thing, but then after you achieve it and then all the accolades that come along with that, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You know, from, from going in any restaurant you want to, don't pull your wallet out. Yeah. You, you, you're the town hero. Right. Or everybody knows who you, you know, here's a bullpen coach. I said, that's the You know, or, you know, it, 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 it's all of a sudden, here's, here's a picture of you, and then all of a sudden, here's a picture of you, yeah. you know. But, you know, the fans, awesome, enjoyed every moment of it. The parade, you know, the millions of people coming to the parade. You know, I, just, just the, the, the presence of being a part 
of winning the World Series and being a part of the, the, the accolades and so forth afterwards. It's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I, you know, and, and I, 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 I meant to bring my ring, you know. I was going to ask you about what's yeah, ring. Yeah, I meant to bring it, Mick. <laughs> I meant to bring it. Uh, but, uh, boy, it's a beauty. I'm, it's I'm a beauty. sure it is. I'm sure it is. And did you ever have that, that moment where you sort of by yourself saying, Lester Strode from McMillan, Tennessee, and I'm going down in this World Series championship parade. I mean, it, it's got to be almost surreal at some it point. It is surreal. It's surreal because who, I tell people this all the time, who thought this small town country boy coming out of McMinnville, Tennessee, who woke up in the morning, because I live in the rural area, right. pig form, cow form, <laughs> plowing, picking green beans, was going to someday be on the big stage right. of a World Series. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, it's surreal, and I'm, I'm so blessed. And um, there was a lot of sacrifices and, uh, uh, that, that went along uh, with this, but... You know, I was uh, uh, blessed to, to have these doors open for me. And every time one opened, I tried to take advantage of it. And I tried to be as persistent as possible to achieve what the goals of, of being successful. And it, and it all paid off. I know you came back and I mentioned earlier and spoke to the students at uh, Warren County High School and you talked about making decisions. That, that's really important to you. Making the right decisions early can, can make a big difference in your life in general. And, and can you tell us a little bit about why you have that, fi that mindset of make good decisions early? Yeah, um, I, I, just, I just think, you know, and like I, 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 like I said, I use that slogan all the time, knowledge is power. And I think if you go about your uh, goals or plans in life the right way. Yeah, you're going to have some ups and downs. Right. You're going to have them, but don't always look at the downs as being a negative. The downs could be telling you something in a positive way that, hey, this may not be the avenue you should go. Maybe it's this the way. It's mm -hmm. going to still get you to your final goal, but this way right now is not the way you should be going about it. You, you should go take, take, the, take the left before you take the right, you right. know. Uh, but yeah, I just think that in life, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be ups and downs, but step back, take a deep breath and, and, and realize what's in front of you so that you can make, don't, don't, don't re react so, and respond so quickly. Right, right. Step back, take a deep breath, look at, look at the big picture and what, what, what is it that I need to do to get there as opposed to being stubborn sometimes and making a bad decision and just dis disrupt your whole life, you know. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's life is, is a challenge and that's the way you should look at it. But, you know, if, if you believe in yourself and you do the right things, you will prevail in the end. And I appreciate that. And I, I, I know you've had a good career, but I think more importantly, you're a good person. And I tell people that all the time. You can rest on your accolades of I've done this and I've done that. But you know, what type of person is that person? And, and you're a good person. And I really appreciate you coming in and being part of the show. I, I really, uh, the stories were good, but uh, the knowledge that you impale, I, I appreciate that even more. So once again, thanks for coming by the soul of Warren County. My pleasure, Mickey, and I'd love to do it again. Whenever all right, you like. all right. And thank you for joining us for this second part of our interview with Lester Strode. I'm Mickey Gwynn. Thanks for joining us for the soul of Warren County. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day.